that chair concludes the enforcement committee update. Wish everybody a very happy holiday. Thank you for that update, Kevin. Um, moving on to agenda item F, licensing and testing. For that, we turn our licensing committee chair, Jim Ruane, and licensing chief, Justin Paddock. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, David. Good, afternoon. Good morning to everyone. Uh, you can find the licensing update on page 237. I will highlight a few items for the board. Regarding applications, the application units are still understaffed. There are currently five vacancies, two staff on prolonged leave, and three employees in their first month of training. The good news is a new applications manager will be starting with the board soon, and when the new staff complete their training, the backlog should begin to drop, and the processing times will decrease also. The current processing time for exam and waiver applications is approximately seven weeks, and the goal is to reduce these processing times to four weeks by February. As you can see on the chart on page 240, renewals continue to be steady. The board's renewal and modification manager is set to retire at the end of December. Staff is working to quickly fill that vacancy as well as several others in the renewals unit. CSLB is on track to be fully staffed in this unit by early February. In the meantime, CSLB continues to utilize staff from other units to assist with processing renewals timely. Moving to page 246 is the call center statistics. As previously reported, call center wait times have been excessively high since April. I'm pleased to report that the call center has been working remotely since November 17th, and with this new functionality, call wait times have returned to their pre-COVID levels, average wait time of six minutes. Special thanks go to our call center staff, supervisors, and the IT division. As announced earlier in the meeting, the public counter is currently closed. All documents should be mailed to the CSLB, along with a check or money order payment for any fee related transactions. The public will be able to come to our public counters at this time, but will not be able to come to our public counters at this time. But thankfully, they can call the 800 number or email us at info at CSLB.ca.gov. You can find the testing update on page 253. Testing centers are unfortunately closed effective December 7th. Staff was able to reduce our pending exam count to approximately 6,000 exams. By comparison, our pre-COVID levels were approximately 4,500 exams. This exam count will begin to rise over the coming weeks with the test center closures. Once staff is able to resume testing, the centers will begin offering additional testing times in the evenings to again reduce the growing backlog. As I stated at the last meeting, if an applicant has an exam scheduled and they want to take their exam sooner, they may send an email to exams at cslb.ca.gov. Staff are often able to find earlier test dates if applicants are willing to go to a different test facility than the one they were assigned to. This is especially true for those in the Bay Area. The Bay Area is the most impacted by the test center closures because the Berkeley Test Center did not reopen in June and is not scheduled to reopen due to ongoing COVID restrictions at that facility. For this reason, staff began the closure process for the Berkeley location as part of the exam administration outsourcing process. The goal is to gain cost savings for the board as soon as possible. Due to this closure, more Bay Area candidates will be assigned to test at our Sacramento facility and the remainder scheduled in our San Jose facility. And finally, the exam development unit has held numerous workshops to continue occupational analysis work for updating existing exams. On page 255, you can see the exam staff are currently working on. Later in the licensing agenda, I will provide more detail on the new B2 residential remodeling contractor trade exam staff is currently creating. That concludes the licensing and testing update and Justin is available if the board has any questions. Do board members have any questions or comments? Okay, uh, does anyone from the public have any comments? This is the moderator. We do have a couple of comments. The first one is from Mark Taylor. And he is asking, in light of current travel and group meeting restrictions, is there any current discussions to consider outsourcing to a national testing company that would enable testing for California licenses in remote locations, including out of state? Can you pick that up? Uh, certainly, Jim. Um, not at this time. We are actually working with our IT division to um, do some more remote testing development. 
we're able already to do um, remote testing development in the occupational analysis phase, and we're working with our IT department for secured ways to do item writing next. Um, that'll be in the coming weeks. Thank you. Any other public comments, Shelley? Uh, yes, our next comment comes from Daryl Cole. His question is, what is the CSLB plan to expedite testing even amid COVID-19? He had a test scheduled on December 8th, and it was canceled the day before. I certainly apologize for that. Um, we are going to be doing uh, what we did when we opened in June. Um, uh, basically, in the order your exams were canceled, we will contact you once we have an opening date. So that would be actually the December 7th scheduled people will get contacted first, then the December 8th people. Um, we're going to try to get our backlog down just the way we did it before, which is we're going to have a third session. Normally, um, in normal operations, we have a morning session and an afternoon session for exams. We're going to be doing an evening session as well. Um, yours truly, and I'll probably be able to cajole, cajole uh, Tanya Corcoran um, in the evenings to help me administer those exams. Um, and uh, it took us, uh, it, it'll depend on how long we're closed. If it's just a month, which is what I am hoping, um, I hope to get back to normal numbers by about February. Um, if it's if it's longer, we'll just have to reassess. But we will do overtime and evening sessions um, throughout the state until we do get those numbers down. Anything else, Shelly? Uh, yes, his follow-up question to that is, can you rent a gym or do it outside? Uh, it would be difficult outside given the weather. Um, what we have done is at several locations, we've created what we like to call an annex. Um, in Sacramento, for example, uh, what is normally our boardroom uh, now is filled with computers so that everyone is six feet apart. So they're actually eight feet apart. Um, we've also done the same in our Norwalk facility. If I need to expand it because our uh, we stay shut down for a long time, I'll certainly consider that and I'll work with, um, with the registrar as well as uh, with our administrative unit. Um, to to figure that out if we're just shut down for a month i we wouldn't be looking into that but if it is longer then then we will have to get creative any, any more shelly uh one more from philip kashanti i'm sorry if i mispronounce your last name his question is as of september how many applications were processed and is the expanding processing times related directly to staff shortages working from home or both uh, it's, it's, I'll go in reverse order so I can quickly look at, um, my processing times, which I have a report here. Um, it, it is both. Um, it's the fact that you're working from home. It is a little bit slower, admittedly. Um, and it also is the staff shortages. Um, Phil Cocciani, uh, work cl works closely with, uh, the contractors board. Um, and as he's aware, um, our applications manager, um, retired. And so we're filling that position as well as several other key positions right now. Our exam counts are looking pretty consistent. Um, yeah, we're we still have high numbers, um, which is unique. The the last time we had a closure, we actually had a reduction of workload, which allowed us to catch up. But right now, the the exam counts are still staying consistent, just like you saw in the summer of this year. Any more, Shelley? Okay, and yes, we have. Um, from Gilbert Collins, is there any processing consideration given to applicants from accredited schools? Uh, yes, there is as far as experience credit. Um, and uh, I can discuss that more offline. Um, uh, if you want to get his contact information, I'm happy to talk with him about his specific situation. Okay, thank you. So the last one, Shelley? That was it. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Justin. Next item is an update and discussion on the CSLB administered surveys. You can find information on page 259 for the new applicant satisfaction survey that went into effect in March 2020. You may recall that board members asked staff to develop a survey to gauge the satisfaction of individuals in the application process. Staff are pleased with the outcomes in the first year of this survey, about 80% satisfied with services they received. However, staff are still developing a method to survey those whose applications were void. Therefore, the data is still not representative of all of those in the application process. With that being said, the initial results do show positive feedback and a clear desire by applicants for CSLB to move to an online application process. 
A breakdown of the results can be found in tables two and three on pages 260 and 261. You can find the Enforcement Consumer Satisfaction Survey on page 267. The Consumer Satisfaction Survey dates back to 1993. This survey is meant to assess the satisfaction of consumers that have filed complaints against licensees with CSLB. In 2019, a total of 1,365 complainants, or 15% of those surveyed, responded to the questionnaire. A summary of the results can be found at the bottom of page 268 and are relatively consistent with the data CSLB has received over the past several years. And Justin is available if board members have any questions. Anything from the board? All right, seeing none, uh, anything, Shelley, from public? Not at this time. Two more items, uh, update on test development for new B2 residential remodeling license classification. Moving to item four, please turn to page 285. As promised, I wanted to provide the board with an update on the new B2 residential remodeling contractor classification. As you know, this fall, the legislature and the governor authorized the creation of this new classification and staff has been working to develop the necessary trade exam for this new classification. I'm happy to report that the CSLB is on track to issue this classification by August 1st, 2021. Not only are staff developing a brand new trade exam, they also have to update several IT systems and begin advertising the new classification through various media. A breakdown of the timeline to ensure this classification is ready by next summer is at the bottom of page 285. Any board comment? Seeing none, Shelly, anything from the public? And seeing nothing from the public at this time. Thank you. Our last item is an action item, review discussion and possible action to grant construction management education account awards. Please turn to page 289 for our final item. You may recall from last year that CSLB procedure changed regarding awarding CMEA grants. From now on, each December staff will present the board with proposed grant awards for our consideration. This year, four institutions applied, the same as last year, and after reviewing the applications, staff proposed grant awards to the CME, CMEA Advisory Committee based on the number of graduates each program had in that ac academic year. The committee made no alterations to the proposal. And it should be noted, too, that the CMA grants monies come from volunteer contributions of our licensees. Staff now asks that we consider the grant award amounts you can find on the bottom of page 290. For purposes of reference, at the top of page 290, you can see what we approved in the prior year grant cycle. I'd like to ask the board to consider the following motion. Direct staff to distribute the 2021 CMEA grant awards according to the recommendation on page 290. And I'd like to ask for a motion. So moved. This is Second. Delatoria. Nancy, second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Is there anything on the question for the board? No. Anything from the public, Shelley? Nothing at this time. Thank you. Please, will you please call the roll? David Delatori? Aye. Kevin Albanese? Aye. Frank Altamira? Yes. Augie Beltran? Aye. Ronnie Cobos? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Don Giratano? Aye. Susan Granzola? Aye. Diana Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. Marlo Richardson? Aye. Jim Mullane? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Nancy Springer? Yes. Mary Tigert? Aye. Motion passes. All right, thank you. And this concludes the licensing items on the agenda. Thank you, David. Back to you. Thank you, Jim and Justin, for the uh, the update and uh, for answering uh, the public's uh, inquiries. Uh, moving on to agenda item G, public affairs. Uh, I turn it over to Public Affairs Committee Chair Diana Love and Public Affairs Manager Claire Goldstein. Good morning thank and thank you, Mr. Chair. The Public Affairs Update begins on page 295 in your meeting packet. 
First, in the staffing area, I want to note that Rick Lopes, the longtime Chief of Public Affairs, has left CSLB to accept a position with the Department of Real Estate. We had an opportunity at our November committee meeting to thank Rick for all his work building CSLB's public affairs office and his commitment to advancing our consumer protection mission over his 16 years with the board. He will definitely be missed. Until he is replaced, Claire Goldstein, the public affairs supervisor, is managing the unit. And thank you, Claire, for stepping into that role. As we discussed during the board chair's comments, the public affairs office was busy at the end of last week, helping to get the word to consumers, licensees, and applicants about the need to close our test centers and public counters because of the COVID-19 health emergency for at least the next three weeks. I'd like to thank the public affairs staff for their work on this effort, especially given the short time frame to get the work done. I'd like to begin the remainder of the public affairs update by highlighting some of the important work CSLB undertook in response to the unprecedented wildfires in California this summer and fall. As in the years past, CSLB dedicated significant resources and time to its immediate disaster response and has already begun its long-term disaster response efforts. Because of COVID-19, the response looked a bit different than in previous years, but as shown on page 296 of your packet, CSLB participated in local assistance centers in 17 um, counties throughout California. In some cases, this involved in-person staffing, in others, sending material, and in still others, the centers were entirely virtual. And in some instances where we were unable to staff local assistance centers in person, staff established a special phone line to allow wildfire survivors to speak directly with a CSLB staff member. The Public Affairs Office also coordinated additional outreach of dozens of congressional and state legislator offices, as well as building departments and chambers of commerce in affected areas. And staff continue to use CSLB's partnership with the social media site next door to target outreach messages to specific neighborhoods. Planning for long-term outreach has begun. This involves working with local counties and jurisdictions to set up rebuilding workshops, one for survivors looking to rebuild and one for contractors who plan to work in the infected areas. A contractor workshop is scheduled for January the 13th in conjunction with the Valley Builders Exchange in Butte County and Public Affairs Office staff has reached out to a number of other counties about partnering to put these workshops on. In addition, CSLB's enforcement staff have posted hundreds of signs in both English and Spanish in the affected areas, warning homeowners about the risk of hiring unlicensed contractors and warning contractors about the penalties for contracting without a license in a declared disaster zone. Lastly, CSLB continues to participate in two multi-agency task force, one focused on debris removal and one focused on housing. Task force members include representatives from federal, state, and local agencies with a goal of coordinating efforts. While disaster responses has certainly been a focus since the last board meeting, I'd like to highlight some of the work of the Public Affairs Office, beginning with our video and digital services. At the bottom of page 298, you will see a list of, five of live and recorded webcasts. The Public Affairs Office has continued to produce a live interactive online workshop 
the first Friday of each month for those interested in getting a California contractor's license. The workshop is called Get Licensed to Guild. We would like to thank board member and licensing committee chair, Jim Ruain, for offering welcoming remarks at the November workshop. Attendance at that workshop continues to average over 200 people. You can also see that public affairs staff have begun producing a series of quick tips videos for the works for the website and social media. These short videos offer basic information about such things as how to use the find my license contractor feature on the website and the importance of disaster survivors hired licensed contractors. Videos currently being finalized focus on how to report unlicensed activities, how to check a license, and the risk to contractors of working without a license in a disaster zone. Public affairs staff work with the IT unit to replace the disaster help center and the website. This page provides important information and resources for disaster survivors, contractors, and the media, and we believe it is more user-friendly and easier to navigate. Page 300 of the meeting packet outlines our social media highlights. As you can imagine, a lot of posts have continued to focus on COVID-19 including construction site safety, as well as disaster response. With a focus on worker safety, <clears throat> doing the worst of the smoky conditions and consumer protection. You can see the additional information on our social media efforts up through page 306. While the number of media calls has slowed with the pandemic, PAO did issue a press release in September to promote CSLB's presence at the Butte County Local Assistance Center and the work of enforcement staff posting warning signs about contracting without a license in the area. And the Public Affairs Office staff taped a segment for the Carey Brothers syndicated radio program called on the house about steps homeowners can take after a disaster. That program aired on November the 14th. Public affairs staff have also issued a number of industry bulletins, most recently, as previously mentioned, announcing the closure of CSLB's test centers and public counters because of COVID-19 and reminding contractors about the importance of following home improvement contractor requirements for solar jobs. On pages 307 to 309, you can see a list of graphics and publication projects completed by our public affairs staff. Updates for the 2021 edition of the California Contractors License Law and Reference Book are on schedule and is expected to be distributed in mid to late January. The Public Affairs Office staff are also currently drafting a fall winter edition of the California Licensed Contractors Newsletter, which is also anticipated, expected to be distributed in January. In addition to the Get License to Build workshop mentioned earlier, Public Affairs Office staff are working on a number of other outreach efforts. These include collaboration with CSLB licensing and IT divisions for the new residential remodeling license, outreach to minority and low-income communities, and a partnership with the licensing division and the board subcommittee of Jim Ruane and Mary Tiger on women in construction. We are also working on our regular consumer and senior scam stoppers. Most recently, the Public Affairs Office staff held two senior scam stoppers via Zoom, one with Assembly Member Tim Timothy Grayson and one with Senator Richard Roth. 
Finally, staff continues to update our employee int intranet staff site with stories, photos, and informational updates. Certainly a time for a busy time, a most busy time for our public affairs staff. I'm sure all of you join me in thanking them for their continued hard work. Since this is an informational item, no action is required of the board. And today Claire is joining us and is available to answer questions. At this time, are there any board comments? Hearing none, Shelly, is there any public comments? Seeing none at this time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, that concludes the public affairs public update and I wanna wish everybody a happy holiday and be safe. Thank you. Thank you for that update, Diana. Um, then we move on to agenda item H, legislation. For that, we turn it to our legislation committee chair, Augie Beltran and legislative chief, Michael Jemnetsky. Gentlemen. Thank you, chair. Uh, we're gonna start out with H1, review and discussion on board study to evaluate sufficiency of current $15,000 contractor bond amount and possible action on study recommendations, business and professions code section 7071.6E. Now we're on page 317 in your packets. Each year, the Assembly Business and Professions Committee and the Senate Business Professions and Economic Development Committee hold joint sunset review oversight hearings to re review the boards and bureaus under the Department of Consumer Affairs. The CSLB is one of those boards. Its operations are reviewed by the Joint Committee every four years. The sunset review process provides an opportunity for DCA, the legislature, the boards, and interested parties and stakeholders to discuss the performance of the boards and make recommendations for improvements. The CSLB satisfactorily completed its most recent sunset report in a hearing early part of 2019. The legislature introduced a sunset bill that the governor signed in September of 2019 and effective January 2020. It extended CSLB sunset date another four years. In addition to some minor technical changes to the law, the sunset bill required CSLB conduct a study of the required $15,000 contractor, $15, contractor license bond to evaluate if that amount is sufficient or if an increase is necessary. The study must be submitted to the legislature by January 1st, 2021. In November, the Legislative Committee considered a draft of the study and authorized staff to present the study for the board. The study concludes that the current $15,000 contractor bond is not sufficient and an increase is necessary. The mandate to, the, to study the bond did not ask CSLB to recommend an amount the bond should be raised to, should it be, or should it be raised at all. However, the study indicates it would not serve the purpose of the bond and may be a barrier to licensure if the bond was raised to a level that would require detailed underwriting of the contractor before the bond is issued. The study suggests that raising the license bond to around $25,000 a $10,000 increase from the current amount would provide enhanced public protection without requiring detailed case by case underwriting. This report is due to the legislature January 1st, 2021. However, the act of staff submitting the study to legislature does not itself cause a statutory change that would change the bond amount. The legislature will receive the study and may or may not consider introducing a bill that would raise the bond amount. The study is in your packet for review and discussion. Chief, what do you got? Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Yes, the Legislative Committee did discuss this uh, study at its November meeting, so I can answer any questions about the study itself rather than go too deep into it here. But we do want to bring to your attention, you will see in the motion at the bottom of page uh, 317, that the staff does ask permission to make minor changes to the study um, after today to before finalizing it. 
And I do want to tell the board that there are three minor changes that we uh, just came across. Uh, so we want to tell you about those. The registrar, the uh, licensing chief, and I did have the opportunity, it was actually on a Tuesday night, to um, speak to the head of claims and head of underwriting for a national surety company. And we were given three recommendations to kind of tighten up three areas. Uh, one is um, about social security numbers as a prerequisite to bonds. Um, the study does not say that a social security number is required to get a bond, but it does emphasize that it's um, because the bond is a credit product that if you don't have a credit rating, it's going there's going to be some extra steps needed to get a bond. Um, that this could be made more clear in the study. So we are uh, planning to add a sentence that makes it clear that there are bond companies that will issue bonds without a social security number, but they will pay a higher rate. And um, there's also the option of getting somebody else, a guarantor, if you will, um, who does have credit to promise that um, you're good for the bond. So we're just, we're gonna add a sentence that makes it a little bit more clear in the study that, hey, a social security number is not the, it's, you can get a bond without a social security number. We're gonna make that more clear. Um, a second change, um, we have a typo in our Washington state um, bonding prerequisites. Uh, we said in the study that the um, a liability insurance is all that's required for a contractor's bond in Washington. Um, that's not true. There is a $12,000 contractor's bond in Washington for general contractors and a $6,000 um, contractor's bond for specialty contractors. So we're gonna change one line there. And finally, we're going to make a note somewhere about our um, $7,500 liability cap um, in another part of our bonding statutes. Um, we're going to, it, there's nothing wrong in the study about this, this area of the law, but we uh, are going to add a sentence to emphasize that if the bond is raised, um, you know, that's one penal sum amount, the 15000 if that's raised, um, the legislature might consider raising the $7,500 liability cap. But if they do that, there's a concern that this might decrease the amount available to a homeowner. The idea being if a material supplier gets to that bond um, before a homeowner, right now they're capped at $7,500. Well, if that goes up, that could increase the bond amount that a material supplier could obtain, which in the, which could decrease future homeowner claims against it. So the, there's nothing wrong in the study. We're just gonna add a sentence about a legislature, um, note this about um, the $7,500 a liability cap. And that's the three minor changes that we would like to make to the study. Um, and that's all I have for now, unless there's questions. You're Mr. Mute. Chair, are you on mute? Sorry about that. Uh, any board comment? Shelley, any public comment? Not seeing any at this time. I see a hand raised by someone named Daryl Cole. I do. I will unmute him. Mr. Cole, your line is unmuted. Did you have a comment? I guess not because I don't hear anything. I don't either. Um, we did receive. Okay. We do have a comment that just came in from Gilbert Collins. Um, his comment or question is, wouldn't any increase in bond sufficiency be mitigated by enhanced processing times and increased educative indoctrination, more education and less punitive measures, uh, i.e. contractors aren't always ethical? Okay, we appreciate that comment and we move forward if there's not any other uh, public comment. That was the last one. Okay, thank you. Um, now, legislative committee recommendation is that the board authorize staff to make any minor or technical changes to the draft study, including any changes recommended by the board and present a final version of the study to the legislature by January 1st, 2021, as required by Business and Professions Code 7071.6. Um, Chief, I got a question. So you said there's a couple of changes, but this comes as a fully formed motion. Is that going to... Uh, change that at all? That's a good question. Um, the motion does uh, ask that the board authorize staff to make any minor and technical changes to the draft study, including any changes recommended by the board, and then prevent a final version of the study. Um, so I, 
I believe that that language, even if it comes as a fully formed motion, would authorize staff to make any minor technical changes to the study. Um, well, let's, but, let's put it on the safe side. Sure. The chair would accept the chair would accept the motion to uh, to do what the uh, chief just said. Anybody out there? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any uh, board comment? Shelly, any public comment? Seeing none at this time. Okay, please go ahead. Mr. Chair, sorry about that. I, I did neglect to mention one thing, I apologize. I just wanna thank um, Mr. Uh, Phil Vermillion for setting up that meeting and also thank um, former board chair, um, uh, former board member, Linda Clifford, for providing us indispensable resources and contacts during the study. I meant to say that at the beginning, I apologize, continue. Great, thank you so much. Felice, please call roll. David Delatori. Aye. Kevin Ebenez. Aye. Frank Altamira. Yes. Augie Beltran. Aye. Rodney Cobbles. Aye. Miguel Galarza. Aye. Don Giratano. Aye. Susan Granzella. Aye. Diana Love. Aye. Michael Mark. Aye. Marla Richardson. Aye. Jim Wayne. Aye. Johnny Simpson. Johnny. Aye. Mary, uh, Nancy Springer. Yes. Mary Jackard. Aye. Motion passes. Wonderful. Okay, H2. Review discussion and possible action on legislative proposal that would make illegal dumping a cause of discipline for licensed contractors. We're on page 363 of your packet. This item involves requests from a member of the California State Assembly, mem Assembly, Assembly member Quirk, that the CSLB consider being the official sponsor of a legislative measure next year involving the Ill I'm sorry? Involving the illegal dumping of construction materials. Chief Jay, why don't you explain a little bit about this? Sure. The uh, yeah, the legislative committee did extensively discuss this measure in November, so I can certainly answer any questions about it for the other members. Uh, but basically, uh, it does make the unlawful dumping of construction debris a cause of disciplinary action against the contractor's license. Now, this activity is already illegal, you know, local and state um, and penal code uh, and local laws. But what we discovered um, when this was going to be a measure last year and working with the author's office that a number of counties, Alameda, Contra Costa, Los Angeles, um, have had some real difficulty with this activity. Apparently there have been some bona fide findings of licensed contractors doing this. And I understand the, um, the uh, sorry, it looks like we just got a question on a prior agenda item. I understand that it's it's made it difficult to process uh, to prosecute contractors um, for this activity. Uh, it hasn't been rewarding, so this measure would be an additional deterrent um, to allow CSLB to uh, uh, discipline contractors for this activity. Um, and I can answer any questions. Thanks, Chief. Do we have anything from the board? Any comments, Shelley? Do we have any public comment? We to um, member Altamura asked if we missed a fully formed motion regarding the bond study. But, so we 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 made the mo. It was a fully formed motion, but since there were some changes from staff, we decided to make the motion uh, instead of just carrying forward with the fully fully formed motion. Does that make sense? Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, and there's nothing else this time. Okay, well, legislative committee recommendation recommend that the board approve assembly member Quirk's request that the CSLB sponsor a legislative measure that would make illegal dumping of construction materials a cause for discipline for licensed contractors. Since this recommendation comes from a committee of the board, it comes to you as a fully formed motion. It needs no first or second prior to the vote. 
Does the board have a comment or question on the motion? Shelly, does the public have a comment on the motion? I haven't received any at this time. Thank you. Feliz, call roll. David Dolatori. Aye. Kevin Albanese. Kevin. Yep, aye. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Frank Altamara. Yes. Huggy Beltran. Aye. Ronnie Cobbles. Aye. Miguel Galarza. Aye. Don Giotarno. Aye. Susan Granzella. Aye. Diana Love. Aye. Michael Mark. Aye. Paula Richardson. Aye. Jim McWayne. Aye. Johnny Simpson. Aye. Nancy Springer. Yes. Mary Tigard. Aye. Motion passes. Wonderful. We're on H3. At the end of this, we're going to ask for a motion from the board. We're going to review discussion and possible action on staff recommendations for legislative proposals to make minor, technical, or non-substantive changes to the contractor state license law. Omnibus, omnibus, omnibus bill cleanup request. We're on page 371 of the packet. Every year, the Senate Business, Professions, and Economic Development Committee invites ideas for technical, non-substantive, non-controversial ideas for changes to the law. These minor changes to the law are usually considered in an expansive measure called an omnibus bill that is introduced each year to clean up different sections of state codes. In the packet are ideas from CSLB staff for this year's omnibus bill that are here for board consideration and possible approval. Chief, what do you got? Sure, I'll just go through these real quickly. Uh, the first one to change um, the title enforcement representative in our statutes, where it's listed to special investigators. Earlier this year, um, our enforcement representatives were reclassed as special investigators. So we want to tighten that up in the law. Uh, the next change would just clarify that our specialty C-22 asbestos, uh, asbestos abatement contractor license we just want to put that in statute as one of the um, the classifications that is appropriate to perform asbestos work. It has been since 2015, but it's in our regulation, not in statute. We're just going to plop it into the appropriate statute. Um, and then the next two changes really are the definition of minor, their typos. Um, one uh, would provide the correct section number in a reference to the letter of admonishment program. And the other would uh, clean up a reference in the solar disclosure document. And I can answer any specific questions about any of these. Wonderful. Board, any questions on uh, the chief's report here? Shelly, anything from the public? Not seeing anything at this time. Wonderful. Bringing it back to the board. Uh, the chair would entertain a motion to authorize staff to submit to the Senate Business Professions Economic Development Committee the four technical non-substantive proposal for changes to the contractor state license law that the chief had mentioned. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Does the board have a question on the motion or the second? Shelley, how about the public? Do they have a question? not seeing any at this time. Wonderful. Police, please call roll. David Delatori. Aye. Kevin Albanese. Aye. Frank Altamira. Yes. Huggy Beltran. Aye. Rodney Cobbles. Aye. Miguel Galarza. Aye. Don Giratano. Aye. Susan Granzella. Aye. Anna Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. Molo Richardson? Aye. Jim Wayne? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Nancy Springer? Yes. Mary Tackert? Yes. Motion passes. Wonderful. We're on number four, which is only informational. It's an update on previously approved legislative proposals. We're on page 377. 
This item explains the legislative proposals previously approved by the board for which board staff are currently seeking authorship for the 2021 legislative year. Chief, do you have a very brief summary? Yes, yes. The, uh, summary is that we've got these proposals out to different prospective authors right now, and I'm uh, on the phone and on email trying to uh, get secured authorship. It's looking positive. Uh, I don't want to name any names yet for potential auth authors uh, as we don't have confirmations, but we are optimistic that we will be successful with these measures. And please let me know if you have any questions about these measures that are previously approved by the board for which we're seeking authorship that are described on page 377. Awesome. Does the board have any questions of the chief? Shelly, how about the public? Not seeing any at this time. Great. Mr. Chair, we kick it back to you. We're done with Ledge. Augie, Mike, uh, thank you for that update. Um, there being no further business uh, coming before this body, this meeting's adjourned. Happy holidays, everyone, and uh, stay safe. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy everybody. holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Same to you guys.